You know, most countries in the world were established by a people group or conquest from another people group. But then every so often you get a country that was established by a group of people that got lost in the desert and then were promised land from an African prince if they could survive in a haunted cave that nobody wanted. Welcome to the world's only accidental underground country by Buddhist monks from Russia. It's time to learn geography. No! Hey everybody, I'm your host Barbs. At the time of filming this episode, as you know, the coronavirus pandemic isolation period is going on, so I'm gonna have to film all my episodes in my office until further notice. Oh, what the art oh, is hey here? Man, you want some coffee? What kind of coffee are you drinking from? Uh, from a Geography Now <laughs> mug. I'm drinking from that. Well, it if, looks so good in this Geography Now shirt. If you'd like to be um, like art and get a Geography Now shirt, you could do so at where? Geographynow.com. Anyway, oftentimes Kitsikwaka is overlooked by most people from the maps because half the time you technically can't see it. Much of it is literally underground. When you live in the desert and need to flourish sometimes, you gotta be a little creative. And when it comes to these people, the very essence of their existence depends solely on creativity. Let's jump to the map now, shall we? Kitsikwaka gets its name from the words Kitsi, which means poison, and Kwaka, which means cave. Why would a country be called Poison Cave? It's a very long story, we'll discuss it later in this episode, but basically it kind of had to do with a dare. That makes no sense. I am more confused than ever. Great, we're on the right track. First of all, the country is landlocked, located in the Sahara close to the tri-point of Niger, Chad, and Libya. The nation, which is shaped like a submarine, is about 4,500 square miles or 12,000 square kilometers in size, making it just bigger than the country of Qatar. Within the country there are only two main settlement towns, the capital Gur, which is situated entirely within the Mogadinza crater. From there the only other inhabited town is Kirkra, right next to the Kirkra reservoir. The country is served by the one and only international airport with only a single runway, Irksha International. The airport only services three international flights to Niamey, N'Djamena, and Alista. Getting around in Kitsikwaka might seem daunting as there doesn't seem to be any roadways connecting the towns and airport. However, the interesting thing is that the country has invested in one of Africa's largest largest feats of engineering and has developed the Q1 and Q2 highways that connect the three points of habitation. You can't see them though because the roadways are almost entirely underground and have pit stops along the way. These were constructed to avoid the harsh desert temperatures and conditions above ground and allow optimal transport. Otherwise, the only other means of transport abroad would be the Trans-Saharan Highway that passes through from Libya and continues on to Agadez, Niger. Now here's the fascinating thing though. Above ground, Kitsikwaka only has two main settlements, the ones we talked about, but below ground ground, the country has more subterranean villages with a higher population than those above. In fact, the capital Gur has more subterranean dwellings than above it. Kukra is actually the third largest town with only about 15,000 people. Along the Q2 underground highway, you find the second largest village, Barsha, which has about 34,000 people, making it the world's largest subterranean town. Yeah, these people do not want to get sunburned. I mean, in the summer months, surface temperatures can reach above 120 degrees Fahrenheit, 50 degrees Celsius. More people actually prefer to live underground than above ground as the temperature is easier to regulate. This is why many of the subterranean houses have pipe vents installed. Many homes and businesses look kind of rugged and rustic with these raggedy stone walls, while others are more modern and developed with shopping centers and tiled walkways. Hmm, now that I think about it, I think I did a video about this topic. Anyway, some top notable spots in case if you'd like to visit include the Temple of Alten, the Thorn Huts of Shokshin, the abandoned fortress of Enasha, the Pillars of Kevha, and the Ula Underground Oasis. Yeah, so as you can kind of tell by now, this country kind of likes to keep things literally on the down low. But above ground, lots of things are happening too. Which brings us to you. Kitsikwaka historically was actually a land that the native Maba tribe in the area actually kind of feared because they believed that all the land around the Mokadinza crater was cursed and filled with ghosts and overall death. Turns out it was actually just a natural gas leak. See, the Mokadinza crater is actually situated on the Wuta Natural Gas Cavern, a deposit in the middle of the Sahara. This cavern has flammable floor pockets that leak and can explode if exposed to fire. Foolish travelers in the past would often camp by not knowing about the hazard and when it came time to get warm it was kind of like man what a long journey i guess i need to camp here for the night and what a better way to camp than setting up a nice hot campfire i'll just light up this tinder and okay then wow and there's scorpions everywhere this place is terrible 
Yeah, and that's kind of why nobody really wanted to live here for the longest time. Anyway, the country is entirely situated within the Saharan Desert with arid dunes and rocky outcroppings that extend to the surface. The nation's tallest point being Padersha Peak, right on the Mokadinza Crater. The country also has no rivers, and the largest body of water, of course, being the Kirkra Reservoir in the Kirkra Crater. This sits on the Kirkra Aquifer, a deep underground hydration deposit that fortunately feeds salty, brackish water into the crater naturally. Since the Kirkra Reservoir is the only natural water source for them, they've invested heavily in desalinization plants that pretty much hydrate the entire country. And after the people came in and settled the area, they actually found a way to harness the natural gas deposits and that's where they get a lot of their money from. Today, Kitsikwaka is the smallest African country dependent on the petroleum industry. It makes about two-thirds of their exports and over half of their GDP is dependent on natural gas. Most of the petroleum industry is state-run and almost all the profits are redirected into the nation's fund reservoir, which in return also distributes into infrastructure structure development. Hmm. We should hang out sometime. This is basically how they were able to expand their tunnel system to accommodate over half of the entire population. And with the arid hot landscape, there are also some species you can find skimpering around in the desert. And with that, here's Gary Harlow to explain. <laughs> Let's do it. As a country, locked away in the middle of the Sahara, you would think that it would be impossible for anything to survive. But think twice, because here's some of the most fascinating species that can be found specifically and only in this country. Such as the blue spotted giraffe, the Saharan obese baboon, the reservoir clawfish, the desert spiked tortoise, the three-legged shrew, flying lavender geckos, and the national animal, the highly venomous and fatal cave whip scorpion. And that little feisty guy is beloved by all for good reason, but we'll discuss that later. And that's all for me. Th th thank you, Gary. And speaking of animals, food, which is sometimes made of animals. Sorry, it's just, it's true. Now, of course, with almost no above ground arable land, most food from Kitsikwaka is actually imported from their neighbors. As a desert country, you would assume, yeah, they probably grow, you know, typical desert crops like dates, and they do to some extent. However, they're also well known for their underground temperate produce. They use the cave systems to their advantage, and with the more cooler, humid climate, they've been able to harvest various species of moss and fungi, which are common used in Kitsikwa cuisine, such as mas o fosse, mas pearl cake, mushroom hummus, and the national dish, mas mushroom stew. So yeah, caves, moss, deserts, and scorpions. Things are getting kind of interesting, aren't they? Well, you haven't seen anything yet because once you meet the people of this country, you're gonna have your minds blown. In three, two, now, Kitsikwaka is probably Africa's strangest demographic anomaly because of two reasons. Number one, it's the only African country that was colonized by Asians. And number two, it technically wasn't really colonized because nobody really wanted it in the beginning. At this point, you're probably more confused than ever. Duh, you bet I am! Perfect, that's great. Here's the graph. First of all, the country has about 101,000 people and is the African country with the highest percentage of Buddhists per capita. The nation is just over half native Kitsimaba at about 52%, followed by the second largest group, the Kitsi Kalmyk, at around 30%. From there, about 14% are Afro-Slav, whom are mostly Russian-descended Europeans that have either lived for generations upon the 18th century or migrated from Russia in the second Slavic wave of the 1970s. From there, the remaining 4% are other groups, mostly Berber or Nilo-Saharan African groups that have moved in from surrounding countries. They use the East African shilling as their currency, they use the Type Q plug outlet, and they drive on the left side of the road but with left-hand steering wheels as well. So at this point, you're probably going Wait, Asians, Buddhists, Africa, what the f Calm down, you ignorant squizzle twit. I'll explain. Now, as we already explained in the Russia and Russian Republics Explained videos, the Republic of Kalmykia, found in Russia, is the largest Buddhist community in Europe. Back in the 1600s, the Oryat Mongol people migrated all the way from what is now Eastern China into the Kalmykia Republic, which is now in Russia. And if you thought that migration was pretty far, oh <laughs> no, the Kalmyks definitely were not done migrating. If you remember back in the Djibouti episode, we mentioned that there was a very brief settlement from Russian Cossacks in Djibouti called Sagalo. Now this settlement didn't really last very long and the French came in and they kind of deported all the Russians back to Russia. However, amidst that group were some Kalmyk Buddhist monks. And as the French came in, the Kalmyks were like, oh, we're not sticking around. We got to run into the desert. Long story short, these Buddhist monks got lost in the Sahara and met a prince of the Maba tribe named Inasha. Basically, it kind of went down like this. Hey, Saharan prince guy, we've been traveling. We need a place to stay. Can we live in your land? There's a haunted cave. 
that keeps killing people over there with explosions and it has lots of scorpions. Nobody wants that land. If you can survive there, you can have it. And I promise my people will support you 100%. Whoa, okay, score, great deal. Well, for one, it's pretty hot. Uh, I guess we should get out of the sun. You guys got any shovels? And that's kind of how it started. The comics discovered which areas had gas fumes to avoid, and after digging extensively, they found a way to swell up the aquifer to fill in the reservoir. Over the next few decades, word spread back to the motherland, a lot more Kalmyks came in, and that's how the two main groups, the Kitsimaba and Kitsikalmyk, kind of worked together to create this nation. They were brought together through the stress of survival. The people of this country are called Kitsikwaks, and that is also the name of the national language, which is basically kind of like a fusion between the native Maba language and Kalmyk. It's written in both the Latin and the Cyrillic alphabet, kind of like an homage to the Russian roots of the Kalmyk people. As a country with strong ties to Kalmykia, of course Buddhism was brought in, and today about a third of the country adhere to the religion. Many of the temples and shrines are found, especially underground, and they're pretty well maintained. Today you can see a lot of traditions, like women that wear the Kitsikwak Kalmyk dress. Also camel racing and desert chess are very famous pastimes as well. Well, we kind of pretty much already explained the brief history of the country, so let's just kind of jump into the famous people, shall we? Some famous notable people from Kitsikwaka might include Gustav Reshku, Anna Elehu, Brennan Pafsko, Gordon Seychelles, Duncan Welsh, Aaron Gwefshin, Jansen Noesher, Carlos Geushwai, Fernando Rivrashli, Adam Kefshosh, Tim Geshai, Samri Eoishi, and Leith Aksheva. So there you go. Asian Buddhist desert tunnel people that work with natives and they made a country and there's lots of natural gas and they use that money to make their country. That's basically Kitsikwaka. You get the deal. A lot of their development though depended on their relations to the outside world though. And of course that means we got to finish off this episode with the... When you're a small desert nation with a petroleum industry in the middle of nowhere and everybody around you is watching, you kind of have to play your cards right with diplomacy. First of all, when it comes to friends, Kitsikwaka is of course close to their immediate neighbors, Niger, Chad, and Libya. These countries provide the most trade and Libya kind of acts as their closest gateway to Europe through the Mediterranean. Recent conflict years in Libya though have been rough in the import sector, so now they depend more on Niger's connections through Algeria to circumnavigate northwards. Canada and Russia are key key players that invested in the subterranean construction projects, as Russia is world-renowned for having some of the world's deepest and fortified underground tunnel systems, and Montreal, Quebec has the world's largest underground commercial network. Kitsikwaka took notes from contractors that flew in to help with projects, and today the countries have close ties, and of course, much of the population of Kitsikwaka has Russian heritage. Mongolia and Thailand and Japan are key players in Buddhist tourism, as all three countries are Buddhist powerhouses. Mongols connect well too, as the Oryat Kalmyk population are essentially their cousins. When it comes to their best friends, however, the Kitsikwaks will always go back to the motherland, the Kalmykia Republic of Russia. The two are closely connected and have historical ties. Kitsikwaks often go back to visit their ancestral homeland, and the Kalmyks often visit to see how their distant African cousins are doing. In the end, they will always be there for each other. Ah, what great friends. In conclusion, Kitsikwaka is a nation that thrives off- <laughs> uh, You guys know that this is an April Fool's video by now. Come on, I've been doing this for years. This is happening- Ah, <laughs> we got you guys! <laughs> April Fools! Yeah, that's right. If, if you got uh, tricked, you have to buy a Geography Now shirt. At where? GeographyNow.com. Ah, uh, April Fools! Uh, April Fools. April Fools. <laughs> Hope you guys had a great April Fools. Stay tuned. The Vasco Republic is coming up next.